This week on Milk Street, we're off to Paris to explore what's happening in the new world of Paris bakeries. We stopped by the famous Rose Bakery near Place Pigalle for a lemon almond pound cake. We interviewed Lindsay Tremuda, who guides us through the new world of Paris food and cooking. And then we visit a very un-French bakery, Le Petit Grain, where they make a salted peanut and caramel tart to die for. So stay right here with Milk Street as we learn how to bake the new Paris world. Funding for this series was provided by the following. Ferguson's proud to support Milk Street and culinary crusaders everywhere. For more information on our extensive collection of kitchen products, we're on the web at fergusonshowrooms.com. For 25 years, Consumer Cellular's goal has been to provide wireless service that helps people communicate and connect. We offer a variety of no-contract plans, and our U.S.-based customer service team can help find one that fits you. To learn more, visit consumercellular.tv. Since 1899, my family has shared our passion for everything that goes into our multi 100% Italian tomatoes. Only tomatoes. Only multi. Designed by cooks for cooks for over 100 years. Cookware collection by Regalware. Handcrafted in Wisconsin. The AccuSharp knife and tool sharpener. Designed to safely sharpen knives in seconds. AccuSharp. Keep your edge. So you have to make a speech. You're going to okay, be in a TV so, show. Uh, I'm really nice uh, to meet you because I love Paris and I love American people. And this is the passerelle of the Grand Jobel. So it's really nice. I mean, welcome to Paris and have a good, good uh, glass of uh, red wine. Bonne année. Six mois. Six mois. No, no. Welcome to the new Paris. Bonjour. Bonjour. Now, you probably have heard that Paris has been called the city of lights, not because it's well lit but because it was, in fact, the birthplace of the Age of Enlightenment. All throughout Europe, it was the center of education and ideas. Now, that was also true for a long time with the culinary arts. But recently, other cities such as New York, Hong Kong, and London have really started to move forward and innovate. But in the last 10 years or so, the new Paris is back. It's always interesting to me when I hear people say, like, well, I don't want to eat a burger or, you know, Korean barbecue in Paris. It's like, okay, but Paris is full of locals and Parisians don't want to eat just French food. Young chefs are reinventing classic bistro fare. They're mixing in Italian and Australian dishes. They even look to South Korea, North Africa, and the Middle East for inspiration. Oh, man. I wouldn't say it's French, but I would say it's fabulous. <laughs> Many years ago, I met one of these chefs. Her name is Rose Cararini. She opened the Rose Bakery in 2002 on Rue des Martyrs. The neighborhood is booming with cafes and cheese shops and chocolate shops, even takeout sushi. Now, the reason I'd like to go to Rose Bakery, especially for lunch, is because it's a classic tea shop. They serve simple soups and vegetable platters, even quiche. But the real reason to go is their extensive dessert menu. So we've gone back to Paris to meet up with Rose and ask her for something I hope she gives us, which is the secrets to her lemon almond pound cake. You're English, you're in Paris. Mm -hmm. So you've been here, a how long have you been here and why did you come to Paris to open? So we've been here about 15 years now. We decided to leave London because we'd come to the sort of end of our a cycle of things we were doing there and the children had left and my husband's French and we came to Paris one day and there was nothing of what we were doing. Um, so we decided just to up and come. Let's talk about the bakery for a moment. Mm -hmm. So some of your things are just spectacular. Mm -hmm. and, and you bake in those long yeah, The long tins. ones, the long tins, yes, for slicing. Yeah, it's not like big cake. But we do a lot of the long cakes. We have about, you know, eight or ten a day. Okay. Pistachio cake, you have coconuts. And lemon almond cake. It's one of my favorites. So what's in it? It's butter and sugar uh, with lemon and rice flour. Hmm. And the eggs, there's some eggs in the middle of that. 
It's a, one of our popular cakes, for sure. So if you substitute rice flour for all-purpose flour, mm -hmm. do you have to do some, make some other changes in the recipe? We didn't. We didn't. You know, it makes it slightly more moelleux, moist inside. Moist. It, it didn't alter the, the final result because there was always a very tiny bit of flour in there anyway. It was mostly ground almonds. We've always tried to make them kind of healthy, so it, for me it kind of uh, fits together somehow. But you know, you can't be 100% perfectly healthy all the time. You know, you need to treat yourself, you need to have nice things, otherwise it's very sad. <laughs>
And now we're just going to brush the syrup over the top. And you can see the syrup has thickened up. And just keep going until all the syrup is used up. In this technique with a sugar syrup, it's usually sugar and then lemon juice or lime juice or orange juice, cooked briefly till the sugar dissolves and cooled. This works for any kind of a dense pound style cake. Mm -hmm. So instead of putting a frosting on, as you said, it also adds some moisture and a lot of flavor it to does. it as well. So it's just a good all-purpose technique. Yeah, it's a great yeah. technique. Now I hate to tell you this. After we've done that, we do no, have I to. Know what I know. You're say. I know. We have to let it cool for two hours so it comes to room what? temperature before we can eat it. Yeah. You just make it. Yourself. I'm not making it up. Cake is ready. We are ready. This cake is good for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Mm. Good centerpieces here. There you go. This is very formal. I mean, <laughs> is this is this low tea or high tea? <laughs> Mmm. When you look at it, it doesn't look moist, mm -hmm. but when you taste it, it's got tons of lemon flavor, and it's very moist. It yeah. is. You get a nice, bright hit of lemon when you eat the top part, a nice crunch of nuts, and you didn't even have to mm. go all the way to Paris. Oh, well, is that, that's a benefit? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <He's> like... <laughs> so we went to Rose's Bakery on Rue de Martyr, and this is her lemon almond pound cake. You can make this at home very quickly. It mm -hmm. takes a while to bake in the oven, yeah. but that syrup at the end gives it a nice bright flavor and also moistens the cake. Just a great sort of all-time classic recipe. Lemon almond pound cake. Yes, except for like I interview Lindsay Tramuda, she's author of The New Paris, about new trends in restaurants and bakeries, and then she took us to see a few of her favorite places. You found some American chefs here doing interesting things, English chefs, Japanese chefs, etc. But in the last 10 years, I'd say, Paris really has changed and now is back on the forefront. I mean, I think it all really began with, with a couple of things. One was we can't deny the impact of social media because even if you were a chef who didn't have the opportunity to travel or, you know, apprentice abroad, like some chefs have, but those who haven't at least now have a tool to see what's happening elsewhere. And I think that really started to happen yeah. around 2007, 2008. You know, these, these chefs or food entrepreneurs are saying to themselves like, well, why can't we have this in Paris? And Paris is a big international city with people of all different walks of life and, and tastes and preferences. So, you know, the, the number two foods when newspapers have asked the French, you know, they want pizza and burgers. Those are like the, their favorite dishes. So that's not what people are expecting. Right. You know, if this is a place that is far more diverse than we've been led to believe. What about the basic bistro or brasserie? Now you mentioned your book, younger chefs, cooks are coming in and rethinking that. So, so when you rethink a bistro, are you going back to the classics and doing them authentically or are you rethinking them entirely? So I think there are two things. You can either riff on them entirely or you can go back to sort of an authentic version but do them better. And so here you have people who are trying to revive this tradition because no one really wants it to go away. And in fact, now that we've swung in one direction and now have a lot of different styles, there is even more desire for that like hearty, classic French meal. And so you do have chefs who have gone more modern and experimental and are now coming back to this um, and saying there is still a place for it. It still needs to be protect protected and I'm gonna do it better. So, and so that's so, now coming, but that's sort of like the next wave is let's protect these traditions and do them better. Well, Paris is back, evidently. Paris so. is back. I mean, some would say it never left, but I would say at least in terms of food and, and beverage, it's, it's definitely come into its own and realized that it needed to do more. It couldn't just rest on its laurels. I think it's time to stop talking and start eating. Let's do it. Lindsay, thank you. When you go to Paris, here's some advice. You should skip the Eiffel Tower and look for the unexpected. Picnic on the Canal Saint-Martin on a warm summer evening, or maybe stop by one of the new Paris bakeries, such as Le Petit Grand. It's not very French, they don't open until 10 a.m., but they do sell jelly donuts and cookies and a peanut marshmallow tart that is to die for. The idea behind a lot of our pastries was we were excited about not doing typical uh, pastries you, you find in a traditional bakery. Uh, Diana, who's our lovely, lovely pastry chef, the best pastry chef in Paris, in my opinion. We let her run with her ideas, with her recipes, so it's definitely quite far from, from, from France. When I came here this morning, I said hello in French, and you said, 
I speak English, <laughs> so I feel like a complete idiot. So, so you're from Bangor, Maine, right? Yes. And you've been in Paris like what two and a half years? Yep. Where'd you get the idea for the fluff peanut butter tart? It was just something I had in the back of my mind as like a staff meal dessert for a long time, and then I tried it and it was delicious. People like and it. <laughs> homemade fluff and then yeah. we do the homemade peanut butter and swirl them together. I notice in Europe they bake very often individual tarts or desserts. Yes. In the United States we don't do that. So w why that tradition here where things are baked more individual sizes instead of doing a big tart for example? So you can have dessert for one. <laughs> so no one can, can mess with your piece? Is that why? Or you can try lots of things. <laughs> Ooh, there you go. Oh, man. Mm. So when we were exploring the new Paris, the thing I did not expect at all was to go to a bakery. And first of all, the head baker is from Bangor, Maine, Diana. <laughs> Secondly, it doesn't open till 10 in the morning. I mean, who ever heard of... Frank's Bakery, not open till 10 in the morning. And they do a lot of cookies and lamingtons, which is those little cakes with coconut and chocolate. And then she also had this peanut butter fluff tart, which are absolutely delicious. We loved them. So we thought in honor of Diana and the new Paris Le Petit Grand, we do it here. Now, this is comprised of three basic elements. We have the crust, which is the buttery, crispy, cookie-like crust. Then we have the filling, which is this ethereal, fluffernutter type thing. And then we have a salted peanut caramel topping that gets drizzled on top. We'll start with the crust first. One cup of all-purpose flour. Then we have half a cup of almond flour. One third cup of granulated sugar. And a teaspoon salt. We'll mix this on low for about five seconds until it's blended. Okay. Then we have six tablespoons of salted butter where it's been sitting out a little bit to get soft. And we're gonna add those very gradually also on low. We're gonna let this go about two minutes until the butter's fully incorporated and it's a loose, sandy texture. Okay, that looks good. You can see that it hasn't started coming together yet, but there are no big pieces of butter left. So now we have one yolk from a large egg and one teaspoon of vanilla extract. Turn it on low until it's fully incorporated, about two to three minutes. All right. So we have a prepared tart pan here, nine inch, just lightly spritzed with some baking oil. And then we're gonna use a flat sided measuring cup. Start in the center, work your way out. And then as you get closer to the edges, let it build up a little bit evenly without pressing yet. I like to use the top of my thumb to prevent it from you know, going over the edge and it also sort of flattens out the top a little bit. Looks very professional. Does it? Then we're going to prick this with a fork about every half inch, which lets steam escape. It prevents a bubble from getting under there and lifting the bottom crust. And then after we do the bottom, we're going to do a little bit along the sides. Now we need to let this firm up in the freezer for about 15 minutes, up to one hour. And then we will preheat the oven to 300 degrees before we bake it. So Chris. This is the lovely crust. After it was in the freezer, we baked it at 300 degrees for one hour. That long? Yes, huh? it's the low temperature, hmm. 300, and that allows all the sugar within the crust to caramelize and it gets evenly crispy. It's delicious crust. So now we're gonna make the filling, which incorporates peanut butter. The type of peanut butter is important here. You want standard creamy peanut butter, not an all natural peanut butter, which can have fat separating and a gritty texture. The base of this filling is a meringue. Every meringue starts with egg whites and sugar. In this case, we're making a sugar syrup and we're whipping egg whites with a little bit of salt and vanilla till they reach a soft peak stage. We want those two things to happen at approximately the same time. You're scaring me. I mean, you're so, scaring me. <laughs> so the sugar syrup doesn't have to be exactly the right temperature, and the eggs don't have to be exactly the right texture. Anybody can make this. Yes. Okay. Oh, absolutely. So how do we get started? Well, adding the two egg whites to the mixer bowl, along with the teaspoon of vanilla and an eighth teaspoon of salt. That's just sort of to get them ready to whip, but we're not going to turn it on yet. Now we're going to start the sugar syrup. We're going to add a quarter cup of water. Then we're using half a cup of light corn syrup for stabilizing and half a cup of granulated sugar. You wanna mix this until it's blended. 
Okay. We're going to turn this to medium high and let it come to a boil. So we're at a good full simmer now. This has been almost two minutes, so we want to get the egg white started on a medium speed. I'm going to give a quick check of this. Okay, we're at temperature, we're at 235, 236. We're gonna remove this and let it sit until the bubbles dissipate. Okay, so we've got this on a, a low speed and we're aiming to pour this right between the beater and the bowl and just a slow, steady stream. So let's go ahead and turn that up to medium and let it whip for about three minutes to cool it down a little bit, let the full aeration happen. And we need to soften the peanut butter so we can fold it in. Would you mind microwaving the peanut butter? 30 to 60 seconds, okay. please. Thank you. We just want it pourable. Oh, that's lovely. Mm. Look at that. We've established the peak is there, and we're going to add the peanut butter on low. We are marrying the two. And then we'll finish folding this in by hand. So when all the white streaks are done, we are ready to put this into the tart. Mm. And then we want to spread mm. this level. And then we're going to let this sit for about 15 minutes while we make the caramel peanut mm -hmm. topping. Two tablespoons of water and a quarter cup of granulated sugar. And then we're just going to give it a very gentle stir to get it evenly hydrated. Okay, good. Then we will turn it on a medium heat, and we'll just barely swirl the pan a little bit as the sugar starts heating up so we can melt evenly. Our syrup has reached a full boil now. As you can see, the sugar is almost melted. We're just gonna swirl the pan very gently, and then we're just gonna let it sit. It may take five minutes, it may take six minutes, but we want to achieve a deep amber color. You'll see it start to color first around the edges, but you want an evenly deep amber all over. Chris, can you see the amber color around the edge? Okay. Now, when this Good. starts the color, mm -hmm. it can go fast, right? Yes, it can, yes. Yeah. So don't walk away at this point. All right, do you see the smoke? Yeah. Now we're ready. Take it off the burner, and we will add three tablespoons of heavy cream. Stir that. And we're going to follow that with two tablespoons of salted butter. There goes the last of the butter. I'll melt it in, blend it beautifully. And now we're going to very quickly add a half a cup of chopped salted peanuts. As soon as those are fully incorporated and coated, we're going to pour this over the top of the tart, spread it, and sort of encourage it to go to the edges very gently. If you press too hard, the peanuts are going to sink into the filling because the filling is that light. Mm. <laughs> now we unfortunately have to wait 10 minutes. 15. 15 minutes. Sorry. Okay. I'll be back here in 10. <laughs> <laughs> this is cool enough now. We are ready to slice it. We're going to remove it from the tart pan first. Just lift it gently like that. Slide it right off like that. Nicely okay, done. Thank you. Yeah. We're going to sprinkle a little bit of a flaky sea salt over the caramel, and you want to do that right before you serve it. So, okay, and you do the honors. I'm a little nervous about cutting this. Oh, really? After what we went through, you're nervous <laughs> about cutting it? Well, yeah, a little bit. Ooh. Thank you. I love the way this filling looks. You can see the air in it. Oh, this just okay. looks so good. Yeah. Right. Mm. <laughs> oh. Enough to make the angels sing. Well, a good caramel has a little bitterness to it, right? Mm -hmm. That's why you, you get into sort of a deep amber. So it balances the sweetness, yeah. Yep. So we went to the New Paris, and uh, this is one of the recipes we brought back, a salted peanut and caramel tart which is absolutely fabulous. A short crust, which is pat in the pan, a nice fluffy Italian meringue inside with a little peanut butter in it, and then a caramel with salted peanuts on top. It takes a little time to make, but it's not that hard, but it is absolutely terrific. You can get this recipe, all the recipes from this season at Milk Street at MilkStreetTV.com. Funding for this series was provided by the following. Ferguson's proud to support Milk Street and culinary crusaders everywhere. For more information on our extensive collection of kitchen products, we're on the web at fergusonshowrooms.com. For 25 years, Consumer Cellular has been offering no-contract wireless plans designed to help people do more of what they like. Our U.S.-based customer service team can help find a plan that fits you. To learn more, visit consumercellular.tv. 
Since 1899, my family shared our passion for everything that goes into our Mutti 100% Italian tomatoes. Only tomatoes, only Mutti. Designed by cooks for cooks for over 100 years. Cookware collection by Regalware, handcrafted in Wisconsin. The AccuSharp knife and tool sharpener, designed to safely sharpen knives in seconds. AccuSharp, keep your edge. Thank you.